election here in Canada too. Well, if we're going to have an election, what kind of leaders do you want? Do you want a leader who's pro-life or pro-choice or what is it that you want? You know, and I want to ask a more broad question. What does it mean to be pro-life? You know, the strange thing is, you know, God has a choice. He, he is pro-choice. And, you know, this is a, a, perhaps that's startling to some people. Yeah, he's pro-choice. But what do we mean by that? Well, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. This is Moses, okay, and he, Moses is quoting, he's, this Deuteronomy is a reiteration of the teaching of the experience of the children of Israel just before they go into the promised land so that it's fresh in the minds of the generation that's going in so they'll learn how to live in harmony with their creator. And anyways, Deuteronomy 30, 11, New Living Translation. This command I am giving you today. This is the children of Israel and through extension for them because the scriptures are for our learning here in the church of God. It's for us as well. This command I am giving you today is not too difficult for you. It is not beyond your reach. It is not kept in heaven so distant that you must ask, who will go up to heaven and bring it down so we can hear and obey it? It is not kept beyond the sea so far away that you must ask, who will cross the sea to bring it to us so that we can hear it and obey it? No, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart so that you can obey it. In other words, it, he, God has provided. He has a witness. He has made it available to us. We don't have any excuse. Verse 15. Now listen. Okay. God is saying, Today I am giving you a choice. Yes, God is pro-choice. Absolutely. He gives us a choice. And what is the choice? I am giving you a choice between life and death between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to keep his commandments, decrees, and regulations by walking in his way, the way of the Lord. If you do this, you will live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you and the land that you are about to enter and occupy. But if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, if you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods, most people's gods in the society are themselves, then I warn you that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live a long and good life in the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Verse 19 He's going to repeat. God is going to summarize here one more time in this section. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Then God expresses a sentiment. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Yeah, God is pro-choice, but he is pro-life because the choice he wants us to make is for life. Here in the 21st century, as well as 3,400 years ago, the God of the Bible <laughs> is still pro-choice. He's giving you and me a choice, but the choice is between life or death. What will you choose for yourself? What will you choose for your, your children or your progeny? In your future. Let's go to Proverbs, you know, fifteen twenty-four. Well, I'll, I'll I'll paraphrase it paraphrase it here. You know, Proverbs fifteen twenty-four observes that the discerning wise are going to choose the high road. You know, it's like that old Scottish song, Robbie Burns. I think it's you choose the high road, and I choose you know you you know I choose the high road, you choose the low road. I don't know whatever, whichever one of that is. But uh, you know, Proverbs says that discerning wise choose the high road, the path that leads upward to life, which is, of course, to be greatly preferred over the low road that it inevitably leads to destruction, you know, the place of the dead. You want to live or do you want to die? 
God is saying he's given us a choice. He's going to record. He's going to notice. What are you going to choose? It's sad to say that not as many as should be are inclined to choose the way of the Lord in our present society and circumstances. Nevertheless, nevertheless, for those who are willing to listen to the advice given by Jesus of Nazareth, uh, turn with me to Matthew 7, 13, Jesus cautions us and he points out that we have a choice. <laughs> we have a choice to make. And it makes a tremendous difference. Jesus said, Matthew 7, um, 13, this is his uh, parable on the mount, so I should say his, uh, you know, when he, this is his Sermon on the Mount, this is sort of, if you want to put it, as the opening of what his ministry was all about. Matthew 7, 13, I'm going to cite this in the Phillips translation. Go in by the narrow gate, for the wide gate has a broad road which leads to disaster, and there are many people going that way. The narrow gate and the hard road lead out into life, and only a few are finding it. You know, it's, it's, it's somebody else said, are there many who are saved, Lord? Well, the question is, what are you going to do? Jesus was saying there are many who are not. They're not looking at the hard the way that goes through a narrow gate. They're looking at just what's broad and easy. But that's going to lead to disaster. It's going to lead to personal destruction. Now, why is this? There is a spiritual principle that Jesus you know, was distilling here that lies behind what Jesus has to say. If we turn to Matthew 16, 23, a little bit later on in, in the gospel, he points it out. You know, why is it that many people will go the broad, easy way rather than the more difficult, narrow way? Anyways, in this scripture, Matthew 16, 23, we see Jesus was strongly rebuking one of his disciples because he'd gotten off track. He was rebuking Peter because he was hindering the fulfillment of God's will. He was, his opinions, his thoughts were getting in the way of Jesus accomplishing the goal of his ministry. Because uh, why? Because at that time, Jesus pointed out very clearly, he said, and I, he was, Peter was not setting his mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. He was cherishing the, the, how people, human beings looked at it, not how did God look at things. That's very important. Most of our leaders these days, they look at things that how people look at it. You know, how are they going to get elected? How can they get in front of a popular movement? Are they considering what God has to say? We as Christians, however, we must be different. We must be different than the, the course of what's going on in our society, the general flow of things, because we must be setting our minds on the things of God. Turn with me to Philippians 3.20. Apostle Paul explained, you know, that as a member of the church, as a Christian, we, it's, he's, uh, he's pointing out that our citizenship is in heaven. This is where our ultimate go goal is. This is where we have our being. This is where we, have, uh, where we are invested, if you want to be. Where we have our resources, where we have our hope, where we have our focus. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from there, we eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there is a second coming. This is a great promise of God. And we, are, we set our mind on the things of God because we, we understand this is an ultimate reality of what's coming. The Apostle Paul also explained it this way. If you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 in the English Standard Version. If then you have been raised with Christ, that is, we're raised from the waters of baptism to a new purpose in life. You know, <laughs> we've repented of our old ways and we've embraced going a new way. We've had hands laid on us and received the Holy Spirit to empower us and to teach us and to lead us and guide us into all truth. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. 
seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. We must be focused on the things of God. The world is not focused on the things of God. The, you know, our politicians and leaders are thinking about how they can get elected and get power and all these other things. Another place, Apostle Paul talked about it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. I'm going to cite this in the Philippians. Thanks be to God who leads us wherever we are on his own triumphant way and makes our knowledge of him spread throughout the world like a lovely perfume. This is what Paul was saying here to the Corinthians about his ministry and how they were going. It was like he's saying the spreading of the gospel was like a, a lovely perfume. That's to those who were in the process of being saved because it is a process. We Christians have the unmistakable scent of Christ. And it's discernible alike to those who are being saved and those who are heading for death, Paul wrote. To the latter, it seems like a very smell of doom. To the former, it has a fresh fragrance of life itself. Who could think himself adequate for a responsibility like this? Only the man who refuses to join that large class which traffics in the word of God, the man who speaks as we do in the name of God under the eyes of God as Christ's chosen ministers. So this is what he, Paul was saying in defending his ministry. We are spreading the gospel. It's a scent, it's a fragrance of life for those who are being saved, but at the same point in time, the gospel, the gospel message is also, it, it says it is, it is an unmistakable, you know, it, it's a smell of doom to those who are process of heading towards perdition, <coughs> complete destruction. Now, when we Christians, as Christians, talk about the sanctity of life, we're referring, what do we mean by that? We're referring to the idea that human life is sacred, holy, and precious. Now, it's obvious, or should be obvious, the sanctity of life issues in the 21st century are at the center of many of our most heated and divisive political and moral debates of our time. Of course, those who <laughs> are not, you know, those who want to push through uh, uh, something that is less or lowering or uh, somehow devaluing the, 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 the sanctity of human life. Um, they would like to think, especially here in Canada right now, that the issue is all settled. And that it's only these, these few weird and strange social conservative types who we try to suppress and keep them out of the you know, media and whatever else, because everybody else already knows that we've got the right thing. We're, we're progressively moving towards better and better things as we do our thing. But, you know, we know that, he, that still, and even at this time, the sanctity of life issues are heated and divisive. And they sometimes end up in court. Now, even today, in today's paper, the whole story is um, this woman who had been in court because her husband, 84, um, at one point in time had, uh, she, he, there were various medical officials who said he had given the consent to have medically assisted suicide. But at the same point in time, you know, there are certain regulations. His death has to be foreseeable. There were others who say, no, his death is not foreseeable. And besides, he has dementia. And this is, this is, you know, this is not according to the law. And so the, the wife of this man, I, I think they've been married a very long time, who was just a year younger, went to the courts, and the courts finally said, well, she seems to want to bring up the issue again and talk about whether it's, you know, whether it's all right, you know, whether it's right or not in the parliament, and, you know, and you know, this has become law, and it's settled, and don't worry about it. And she, you know, she, she didn't agree but she can't prevail in the courts. But, you know, when we talk about hot button issues, abortion, embryonics, stem cell research, euthanasia, euthanasia or medically assisted suicide, 
among you know a variety of others. Uh, these are the things that are divisive, and they're still hot button, hot button issues. Mm -hmm. And it couldn't be otherwise, because you know, as strange as it could be, you know, whether it's uh, here we are, some thirty four hundred years from the time of Moses, we're still being called upon you and I to make a choice, just as the ancient Israelites were so long ago. As it said in Deuteronomy 30, 19 again, today God says, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make so that you would choose life so that your descendants might live. Well, that should be obvious. If you choose life rather than abortion, you will have descendants and they will live. It may be tough, it may be difficult, who knows what, you know, the world and what we've going through. But if, you know, if we choose life, we will have descendants and we will live. And we love, if you choose abortion, you won't have dis descendants, for at least from the, the, the babies you abort. From the perspective of the Creator, all human life is precious. Life is given to us as a gift from God. We are to respect and appreciate this gift through all the stages, from conception all to its final stage of, you know, the end of life, natural death. Why? Why do we, as Christians, hold this to be our standard of how we are to approach things and the way of how, what we do and how we behave? <clears throat> well, we base it on the scriptures again. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Now, I'm going to cite this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Then God said, let us make man in our image. The Hebrew is Salam. Strong 6754. Uh, Salam image suggests, uh, as, as lexicon would say, reproduction in form and substance, physical or spiritual. Let us make man in our image according according to our likeness. This is God speaking, Elohim. Likeness is again, is the Hebrew demuth, Strong's 1823, the idea of resemblance, an outward similarity. So let us make man in our image and our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock, all the earth and the creatures that crawl on the earth. He's giving them dominion over the natural sphere because God is dominion over the universe. And so to teach us responsibility and good stewardship, he gave us a dominion on which we are, you know, which we have uh, responsibilities for. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Male and female were created in the image of God, the likeness of God. Some of the commentaries would note that in the image of God, man being created, he possesses divine qualities, qualities that are indestructible, indestructible inalienable, such as free will. They can't be separated. Man, we are, we, we are what we are, and it gives us free will. We have choices. We can do this, and we can do that. We don't say, I'm born that way, and I have to do some sort of behavior. No animals possess this sort of thing. We human beings make choices because we are made in the image of God. Humans are made after the likeness of God. Human character has the potential to be like that which is divine. We are capable of approaching or drawing back from or receding from this likeness of God. Now, whatever likeness that we have with God, whatever similarity, outward similarity, inward similarity, you know, it will never be perfect while we're still mortals. And we have the option. We can choose to either increase it or decrease it. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20. Ephesians 4 and verse 20. I'm going to cite this stain with the Holman Christian Standard Bible for a moment. But this is not how you learned about Messiah, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, because the truth is in Jesus. The truth is in Jesus. It's in what he taught. 
it's even in his person from this standpoint, if you in different ways of looking at it, you took off your former way of life, the old self, that is corrupted by deceitful lusts. That's what you repent of. That's, you know, when you're baptized, this is what you repent of, and you take it off. And you are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. God gives us his Holy Spirit when we're baptized and hands are laid on us and we receive his Holy Spirit. It renews our minds. God's Spirit joins with our human, human spirit and it renews our minds, how our thinking. You put on the new self, the one created, Paul says, according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. It is... You know, by, by being renewed, by putting on the new self, we are. And we do start to resemble more closely the image of our Creator. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8. He makes this point one more time, Paul does, so to make sure that we get it. Colossians 3 and verse 8. But now you must also put away all the following. Okay, what are the things that Christians aren't supposed to do? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Well, that's a you know that's saying a lot in this day of social media. <laughs> We've got to be very careful what we say. We must put away anger and wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. We are going to fulfill what, you know, how, what humanity was originally uh, designed for and created for it in the, being in the image and likeness of God. Every human being as being created by God in his image and likeness is therefore loved by him. He makes this very point. Christianity emphasizes this. Let's go to John chapter 3 and verse 16. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God loved the world in this way. Okay, it is here, the, uh, this is the right way of translating this because it is an adverb of matter, not degrees. This is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life life. God loves us. He gives us this opportunity that we won't perish, that we will have life. He's saying choose life. Be pro-life. I am. <laughs> I want to give you life. Therefore, every human being's life has inherent worth and dignity and potential. You know, that we can become, you know, we can draw close to God, that we can bear his image and his likeness, be, being regenerated by the Spirit. Respect for life is acknowledged to be a core principle, even in, in Canadian society. That's because a lot of people who drafted this, a lot of them were religious people who knew something about their Bibles. Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Human Rights states that everyone has the right, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. The Supreme Court of Canada recognized that Canadian society is based on, upon respect for the intrinsic value of human life and on the inherent dignity of every human being. Of course, the problem that the courts have these days is who is a person? <laughs> Who's a legal person? And what does this mean? So we will argue about what is the inherent dignity of human beings and security of the person, and they do. Right to life? According to the Bible, human dignity does not depend on our ability or circumstances, or even from this standpoint, the stage of life that we're in from conception to the very end of life. It flows because it flows from our creation in the image and likeness of God. That's where this dignity uh, that we have, this is where the basic human rights, uh, you know, and our, this is where it comes from. This is where it's founded on in reality. 
Therefore, it is our duty as Christians that we treat each other, other human beings, as bearers of God's image, not as just merely objects for our own personal gratification, exploitation, or abuse, for whatever reason. Our lives and all other human lives, of course, you know, they, we don't, we're not our own. We belong to God. We belong to God. He made us. He owns us. He created us. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. I'm going to cite this from Young's Living Translation. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. <clears throat> Have you not known that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit in you? Speaking to Christians, people who are converted people who have received God's Spirit, at which you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Glorify then God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God buys us with a price. Price of the blood of Jesus died on a cross. That our sins might be forgiven, that, and that he redeemed us. You know, from the culture of death that pervades in this world. Let's go to Romans chapter 14 and verse 7. <clears throat> I'm going to cite this one in the Phillips translation. Paul said to, to the brethren at Rome, The truth is that we neither live nor die as self-contained units. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. We're all part of this network, this web, of, this web of life. And what happens to one affects us all. And how <clears throat> the standards we accept or what we do, it affects others. Our ideas and actions do bear consequences. Our choices that we make, and it touches the lives of other people, can profoundly affect other people. That's why what we decide if we choose life and our pro-life and our approach, it will have a positive effect. If we choose death, it has, in the culture of death, it has a negative effect. Because our lives are part of a complex tapestry. Many threads being coven, coven, you know, cunningly woven together, each thread contributing something of the overall meaning of existence. Sounds like that song, Finlandia, which we, <laughs> which, uh, who was the composer? Anyways, he had that same idea, uh, I guess the lyrics that were composed for that anyways, bring, brings that to bear in the gospel song. For us, therefore, as Christians, the concept of cherishing the sanctity of life, you know, making this a principle of how we approach things and think on things and make our decisions, you know, you know, being pro-life, you know, it's, we have this, but it means so much more than just merely opposing, for instance, when this is, as the media will use it, uh, oh, he's pro-life, that means he's against abortion. <clears throat> no, it, it means more. When we talk, think about the sanctity of life, there are so many different elements. It's very broad. It's a tapestry. For Jesus himself you know, said, in part of his ministry, you know, his purpose of what he, why he came to earth to begin with and what he was trying to accomplish, he said this in John chapter 10, verse 8, and I'm going to cite this in the Amplified Bible version. Jesus said this, All who came before me, now, Speaking at a point in time there, in their, you know, that uh, it would have been the second decade of the first century, a long time ago, almost 2,000 years ago, you know, there were all sorts of false messiahs. There were self appointed leaders in the community. But all who come before me, even in our time, though, there are many people in our political leaders who put their agendas and their ideas ahead of those before Jesus Christ, all who, you know, they put themselves before Christ are thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not hear them. We don't hear them. I am the door, Jesus said. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and live forever. Speaking of if we enter you know, into the sheepfold where we are protected from the wolves. Anyone who enters through me will be saved. And the Amplified notes and live forever. That's what it means to be saved. 
and will go in and out freely and find pasture. Speaking, the, the metaphor is of spiritual security, of well-being, spiritual prosperity. The thief comes on only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have came that they may have life. They may enjoy life. I've come that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance. A rich, satisfying life, life to the full, till it overflows. That was Jesus' purpose, that they might have life. What we have right now is just a foretaste. But God holds out in his promise to his people who will make their choice to choose life. As a Christian, being pro-life should be about promoting this abundant life that Jesus himself talked about. This rich, satisfying, this life to the full, this life that overflows with good things. We should, we should, you know, we should be promoting this, moving it forward and with our talents and the skills and the things we can do in spite of all the strong opposition that's arising from, you know, what I... But a now deceased uh, Roman pontiff, which called inappropriately so, the culture of death. It is a culture of death. There is a culture of life and there is a culture of death. They are opposed to one another. The gospel is a perfume to those who are being saved, but the gospel is also the stench of death to those who are on the way to perdition. Because it teaches and says something they don't want to hear. You know, the, 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 you know, perdition being destruction, the road to perdition. That, maybe that's old-fashioned language, but it means personal destruction. Now, the media today typically tries to frame our protective stance for the culture of life, the sanctity of life issues, by talking rather they'll look at, oh, what we're against, rather than explaining what we're for. I mean, put it in that light. Certainly being pro-life, you know, however, you know, I'm not getting away from it. You know, I freely admit, you know, being pro-life means being, you know, and opposing abortion because God himself, you know, <laughs> takes in interest in a human being even before they are born, according to the scriptures. Let's go to Psalm chapter um it is Psalm 139. You could look at them as chapters. Anyways, Psalm 139 and verse 13. Psalm 139 and verse 13. David said this, You created every part of me. You put me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because you are to be feared. All you do is strange and wonderful. I know it with all my heart. When my bones were being formed, carefully put together in my mother's womb, when I was growing there in secret, you knew that I was there. You saw me before I was born. The days allotted to me had all been recorded in your book before any of them ever began. It's a powerful witness, powerful message of where, you know, how does God look at human life? You know, God looks at us and he sees us. He's thinking about us even in the womb, before we are born. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, God is saying to Jeremiah, I knew you. Yeah. You know, I, the employee says, and I approved you and put my stamp on you as my chosen instrument. I chose you to do this work. I picked you out. I formed you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. That is, he set him aside. He dedicated him to himself as God's own, his messenger, his prophet. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That's an amazing thing. 
you know, we have several strong witnesses where God, you know, takes an interest and it involves himself even before one is born. Abundant life people, pro-life people are against any form of shortcuts that take life contrary to the scriptures. Scriptures do allow for capital punishment for people who commit to, you know, murder and kidnapping and this sort of thing. But for people, you know, for an average person, that's, that's a legal process where people, where there is justice that is administered. But pro-life people were against, you know, homicide. We're against infanticide. We're against abortion. Yes, we are against genocide, euthanasia, medically insisted suicide. And why? <laughs> you know, the media likes to say, oh, you're against these things. Why? Well, because the commandments say very clearly, you shall not murder. It doesn't have to explain a whole lot of things. The spirit of murder and the spirit of hate. Jesus said, if you even have the, the spirit of hate and you're hating people, you have the spirit of murder. You'd do it if you could. You're already thinking it. Something terrible about being against murder and hate? <laughs> It would seem so sometimes, some people. Oh, you social conservatives. <laughs> yeah, we're against murder. We're against hate, even. We are. That's so terrible. Yeah, I must be. Some people really, you know. Anyways, the Ten Commandments that God gives us in his scripture are, you know, they're a divine summarization of the universe's moral logic. It's how things work spiritually throughout this uh, world, this universe. And, you know, it was originally, the Ten Commandments were originally written by the hand of God himself. That's what Moses wrote down. He originally wrote them down. I guess he used his finger on the stone, you know, he just engraved it. These Ten Commandments then were expanded upon by the Lord God, as you see in the scriptures, in statutes and ordinances, statutes that would explain in detail how the basic ten principles would be applied in situations found in Hebrew culture and ordinances would be case like case law, how God would decide different things to reveal his will. He gives us the ten broad principles and then he broke down certain things that came about so we would have this information. Now, the prohibition against murder in Exodus 20 is of course the sixth of the Ten Commandments. And of course, you know, they're framed, you know, we have, they're located, the first four commandments are teaching us about our central points and how we relate to God and our, how we as human beings relate to God. And the last six about how we relate to our, our fellow man. The fifth commandment, such as to honor your father and mother, God put it in there and why? Because, you know, no matter in many ways, it doesn't say honor your father and mother if they did a good job. <laughs> if they didn't screw up, if they, no, you're still supposed to honor them. Why was that? There was no qualification there. You are to honor your father and mother. Why? No matter how well or how poorly they did your job as parents, we honor them because they were the living instruments through which God gave us life and brought us into the world. It's an amazing thought to think about. That's why we honor them. God's pro-life, procreation. <laughs> yeah, we're, you know, we, we create with God, <laughs> hand in hand. We fulfill his job. Hopefully we do a good job, or at least make it a good, good solid effort to do a good job as parents. But God, you know, there's a reward for that, I'm sure. But some parents don't do a very good job. And it reminds me, you know, in this, this week in our local paper here on the Vancouver Island, there's a story of baby Jessica. And this began a long time ago, 34 years ago. In 1986, in April, the, um, a shivering infant with her umbilical cord still attached was found in a pink striped Adidas bag that had been tossed into an overgrown watery ditch on Triangle Mountain in Colwood on Vancouver Island. 86, it's a 
it's occurred to me because it's five years later, I did come to Colwood and Triangle Mountain, and I, and I lived there for a pile of years. So I could put myself at the place. I saw the place where this, you know, all these things happened. Turns out that three 15-year-old boys were on their way home from Belmont Secondary, where some of my sons actually went to high school. <laughs> and they were making their usual trip home up uh, Walfred Road when they heard some crying. They heard something. These 15-year-old boys you know, decided, what is that? They decided to investigate, and they, they, they found this pink striped Adidas bag, and they pulled it out, and they, when they opened it up, they found a soaking wet newborn girl baby, and they brought her to safety. Years later, the rescuers would mention to the paper that they saw how the baby's upper lift was trembling because she'd been crying so much. I don't know if you've, if you've had children, you know what that's like. I know it's, I can picture it in my mind. And they could see the water dripping off the face. The fact that she survived is even the time she was there. The baby was only one or two hours old. According, because they, they, you know, obviously I think they took the baby home to mom. And mom said, hey, we we're on the way to the hospital and this sort of thing. And um, the nurses just loved her from this standpoint. And she was adopted. There's an interesting thing. This was, this was 1986, you know, only 34 years ago, but the scriptures talk about this experience. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 1. Ezekiel 16 and verse 1. Are you pro-life? Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying to Ezekiel, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, okay? I've got a problem with where you're going spiritually because you're having all these idols and all this other stuff and you're not listening to me. You're not choosing life, you're choosing death. And so God is going to use a metaphor. What's the metaphor that he decided to use? Your birth and your nat nativity are from the land of Canaan. Okay, that was an insult. <laughs> you're a Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite, you know, Pagan, and your mother was a Hittite, you know, two of the pagan tribes that the Israelites are supposed to cast out. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. Baby Jessica is still attached to her umbilical cord. You were, uh, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you, nor were you rubbed with salt, nor wrapped with swaddling clothes, you do to a newborn. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into an open field where you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. Dramatic picture, not a very pretty sight. And when I passed by you, God says, and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. And he rescued her. He saved her. You can read the rest of the here in Ezekiel 16 in this metaphor you know, that God was using. But in some of the way, these three 15-year-old Conwood boys, you know, they were passing by and they had compassion on this baby. You know, Colwood RCMP at the time in 86, 1986, appealed to the public for information. You know, they wanted to find the birth mother. But this woman was never found. In mid-2019, 33 years later, just last year, um, Corporal Hayden Brown, Barrow of the RCMP, I guess the West Shore Division, picked up the cold case of baby Jessica, who is now a full-grown married woman, has three childs of her own. I think she was living in, um, I think she lives in Edmonton, if I remember of her own, and anyways, he said to the paper, he said, you know, the fact that this baby was an abandoned newborn baby, just a, you know, one or two hours old, this was a serious offense, he said, abandoning a newborn infant could have resulted in a homicide if she had not been found. And would have been, I'm sure. But for those boys walking home from school, you know, ironically, you know, the RCMP was picking up this case even after all this time because, you know, she was a legal person. 
if she had been aborted the day before, two days before, and tossed in, nobody would have, she wouldn't have had any rights. Nobody would have been following up on her case or anything else. It wouldn't have been interested because according to Canadian law, it wouldn't have been a homicide. She wasn't a person. You know, that's one of the, that's one of the injustices of our society. See, God doesn't look that way. He didn't look at David that way, didn't look at Jeremiah that way. You know, he looks at us and he is concerned from conception all the way to the day of our death. This abandonment of baby Jessica was an unsolved cold case until recently by means of ancestry DNA. You know, they encouraged her to take a swab and say, let's see what we can find. And it turns out they found a second cousin of the person's, it wasn't an exact father, but it was close enough and from the second cousin, they started asking questions and they traced it down to this man and said, where were you? <laughs> 1986. <laughs> and it turns out this fellow had a girlfriend and he was living in the, on Vancouver Island. But he didn't know. He said, I, I don't know if she's pregnant. <laughs> I had no idea. She's my girlfriend at the time. She never said anything to me. He didn't know. He confronted her. Turns out, yes, he tracked down his former girlfriend, which is amazing to think about just to do that. And she eventually confessed to being the birth mother because of course the DNA test proved that he was 99.999% dad and he knew who mom had to have been. Now the woman's identity, the birth mother who abandoned there is protected because Jessica was under, uh, because she was under 18, excuse me, at the time and she abandoned her infant daughter. Um, she never told her family. Her own parents never knew. And she thought she was going to take her secret to the grave, but you know, it didn't work out that way. Life is a tapestry. We, the decisions we make, we have profound effects. Jessica's biological father was overjoyed when he discovered he had a daughter he didn't know about. They got together. Place called Falkland, you know. He, you know, I drive through Falkland on occasionally, and he, you know, they stayed up many nights sharing, and they're learning from each other and seeing how they share things. Everybody, Jessica said, wants to know where they came from and who their family is. You know, although Jessica has forgiven her birth mother for placing her in the ditch. She's, you know, she feels hurt and angry about the lack of any sort of acknowledgement on the part of her birth mother. And, and her birth mother really doesn't want to have any relationship at all with her, you know, and turned her back on her. It's too painful. She doesn't want to, she, this, the birth mother has a new family and has kids and she's in her 50s now. The West Shore RCMP is going to submit a report to the Crown Council recommending the charge of abandonment under the criminal code, but it's going to be up to the Crown to decide whether prosecution is in the public interest. There will be a judgment on that call, judgment call. But we're accountable. It's, it's interesting. After all this time, we're accountable. And the decisions we make have a difference. We should choose life rather than death. For ourselves and for our progeny. Matthew in the Gospels, Jesus said this in Matthew 5 7 The merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. I'm sure those three boys will be shown mercy at some point in time in the future. The scriptures have a lot to say about how we accomplish and do things and how we're to look at other people. And this whole question of sanctity of life, do we cherish those who are made in the image of God, in the image and his likeness? Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Luke chapter uh, 10, verse, uh, start with verse 25, excuse me. New Living Translation. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, do your own thing. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say do your own thing. Do whatever you feel like. Do whatever the government tells you you can do. No, he didn't say that. What does the law of Moses say and how do you read it? Okay, so the law says this and so how do you read it? How, what sense do you make out of it? And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, bingo, Jesus told them. Do this and you will live. But the man wanted to justify his actions. You see, he had an agenda. He wasn't telling Jesus the whole story. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, there's a reason why he was asking this, but, he wasn't, but Jesus saw beneath it. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. But he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan. See, if we're, if we're going to update it for the 21st century, why don't we say a Palestinian? <laughs> you know, for to make it a current state. Then a despised Samaritan came along. When he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of them. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him which were um, two denarii, two days' wages, okay? if you want to put it into contemporary, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The person who was in need. Who was the neighbor? And Jesus, uh, Jesus asked. And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. That was the one who was his neighbor. He showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Being holy pro-life means being consciously humble in carrying out our role in this world as stewards of God's. God created us. He has covenant with us. He has covenant with us to be, and he's chosen us to be his representatives on this earth in such a society as this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Paul said this to the Corinthians. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ certain that God is appealing through us to our society around us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Choose life that you might live an abundant, rich, and full life. Choose life, be reconciled to God. Yes, abundant life people, you know, we are pro-life people. We're concerned about protecting those who are abused, devalued, destitute. Abundant life people, we're interested in creating, you know, because we're made in the image and likeness of our creator. We create, we craft, we invent, we design, we organize, we, we protect, we nurture, we sing, we speak, and we protest injustice, all like our heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, Abundant Life people celebrate, of course, beauty. We practice virtue. We encourage procreative activities. We protect against harm. We order the disorderly and actively resist those who seek to do evil, to annihilate, to destroy. Abundant life people even concern themselves, you know, with the, with the treatment of how we treat our, our pets. And even plants, trees, both of which have given, you know, they're there for our, for our use, for our benefit. So we must, you know, we do what we do in, in a way that would please our Creator. That we show we're great, or we have gratitude and appreciation for the things God gives us to sustain us, 
by how we treat the things around us in an appropriate, proper way. Abundant life people, yes, we are, you know, surely we are uh, pro-life. We're against abortion, I, I, you know. I still remember when I was in, in teacher's college one time and this came up. In the whole classroom of people, and there was only I. And somebody asked about abortion. How do we feel about it? And I said, I'm against it. And there's only there's one other person. Sometimes you have to be counted, stand up and count. But it's not just that. Abundant life people are involved in music and art, gardening and building and writing poetry and the things we do in service to God's in our community, developing the gifts that He is giving us the talents that he's given us to serve others, all in a means of resisting the culture of death that is the predominant culture of our time. Yes, abundant life people, we're thankful for the gift of life that God has given us, and we're willing to extend mercy to others, to show this mercy, to practice this mercy, to treat others as our neighbors, to love them as ourselves. Because we know that we have uh, this abundant life is not just now, but it's also in the world to come, of which the scriptures speak intens uh, intensively in the resurrection that is yet before us. As Christ's ambassadors, and we are, <laughs> as the Apostle Paul said, as Christ's ambassadors, we have joined Christ's mission. We are, as he would say, we are co workers him with Christ. And Christ came that we might have life and might have it abundantly. Let us be about being pro-life, the abundant life, and the things we tackle. We'll hear more about this in the coming weeks. Let's pray.